Well. <laughs> I'm not used to being. Good evening, everyone. Oh, that's good. Get people from education and they, they actually answer like that. I don't usually get that. At this, so. Good evening and welcome to the 2013-2014 Lectures in Catholic Experience. My name is Christina Vanin. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Religious Studies here at St. Jerome's University and the director of the Master of Catholic Thought program. And I'm coordinating this year's lecture series. Before we get started, I'm going to ask you, please, if you have anything that makes any kind of sound whatsoever, would you please power down, as they say on Southwest, at least, when I was flying back and forth on my sabbatical. Thank you. In his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis speaks about the role and significance of Catholic education in our culture. He talks about universities as outstanding environments for articulating and developing the evangelizing commitment in an interdisciplinary and integrated way. He goes on to say that Catholic schools, which always strive to join their work of education with the explicit proclamation of the gospel, are a most valuable resource for the evangelization of culture. In other words, Catholic education is a critical way through which the church has acted as a mediator in finding solutions to problems affecting peace, social harmony, the land, the defense of life, human and civil rights, and so forth. Francis says, as we continue to do this, we need to be reminded that we must be bold enough to discover new signs and new symbols, new flesh, to embody and communicate the word of the gospel. Given all these statements about Catholic education, it is especially fitting that we have Graham McDonough with us this evening to deliver this year's Waterloo Catholic District School Board Lecture. Dr. McDonough is Assistant Professor in the Faculty of Education and an Associate Fellow at the Center for Studies in Religion and Society at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. He has a Bachelor of Music in Music Education and a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature from the University of Saskatchewan. And he has an MA and PhD in the Philosophy of Education from the University of Toronto. He has published a number of articles in journals that deal with Catholic education, moral education, teaching and learning. He reworked his doctoral dissertation into the 2012 book, Beyond Obedience and Abandonment, Toward a Theory of Dissent in Catholic Education, which was published by McGill Queen's University Press. And he is co-editor of the 2013 book, Discipline, Devotion, and Dissent, Jewish, Catholic, and Islamic Schooling in Canada, which was published by Wilfrid Laurier Press. On a more personal note, we found out over the last 24 hours that Dr. McDonough has family ties to our region. His grandfather is a member of the Kunz family. He was born and raised in St. Clements, and then he moved to Saskatoon to Homestead. And Saskatoon is where Graham was born and raised. We also learned that Graham's father, Ken McDonough, was the director of the Greater Saskatoon Catholic School Board, Schools Board of Education for 18 years. And our own Dr. Miroslav Tatarin in the Department of Religious Studies here remembers Graham as a great student that he taught at St. Thomas More College at the University of Saskatoon. So on so many intellectual and personal levels, we are fortunate to have Dr. McDonough with us tonight. So please join me in welcoming Graham McDonough. Thanks, Christine. Thank you, everybody, for uh, being here on a, on a very uh, snowy day. And I really appreciate the time you've uh, taken uh, on this evening to be here. Uh, Christina, thank you very much for all the work you've done uh, to uh, put me in this spot where I can, I can speak. Uh, it's taken a long time. Thanks to St. Jerome University uh, as well and uh, to the uh, Waterloo Catholic District School Board for uh, 
sponsoring this lecture uh, tonight. So, uh, I don't know if my slides are, there we go. Uh, there we go. Uh, tonight I'm going to make an argument that faithful disagreement is possible in Catholicism, good for the church, and good for Catholic education. The subject of faithful disagreement, or as I call it in my book, dissent, is an important but difficult one in Catholicism. As a concept, it has been acted, and as it has been acted in the history of the church, faithful dissent encompasses the hopes of those who wish for reform in the church. And initially, one might imagine faithful reformers uh, who call for female ordination and recognizing same-sex marriage as dissenters. And I can affirm it is possible to dissent on these topics. But faithful disagreement also encompasses other quarters in Catholicism, like those which criticize the bishop's approved religion and family life curricula for not being Catholic enough and uh, allegedly presenting a distorted picture of doctrine. But even though dissent is possible, it has not been emphasized as part of Catholic life. These are, there are views out there that maintain Catholicism has never changed and is unchangeable. Other views quickly reduce Catholic life to the assent to propositions of faith, sometimes measured against how firmly uh, and consistently one structures his or her identity according to papal encyclicals, the catechism, and canon law. In the context of Catholic institutions like schools, this attitude can easily be taken up as a convenient measure of differentiating from the secular liberalism of public secular schools. Raising the topic of dissent, even in terms that are hypothetical and conceptual academic questions, in times and places where Catholicism and Catholic schools feel they are under threat from secularism, nihilism, and relativism, can quickly lead to resistant postures and attempts to downplay and diminish the thought that we might even talk about dissent. Dissent can pose a threat to the prevailing power structures and commitments in a community. Even, ironically, it seems, in a community that worships a divine and human actor who disrupted the norms of piety and ritual purity in his day by associating with prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners who overturned the vendors and money changers tables in the temple. And I give credit to uh, Richard Fields, Shields at the University of Toronto uh, for this point, whose parable of the Good Samaritan shows that one does not discover neighborly solidarity in legal codes and legalistic righteousness, but in the loving response one makes to those in need. And the fact that it was a racial outcast who made his response uh, in that parable also channels an additional lesson that would have turned first century thinking on its head. So because my talk tonight is similarly predicated on this challenge to prevailing views, it has also been the subject of some resistance. I can demonstrate this by referring to the first title for this lecture that was publicized in September 2013. And unfortunately I don't have it and I couldn't produce it in bigger font, but it says uh, Faithful Disagreement. This title appears in the original pamphlets and was on the SJU website as of the 28th of January. However, as of the 27th of January, I, I learned that the title had been changed to this, Dealing with Questions and Challenges. Now, this is no small change. Now, it wasn't my idea to change it, uh, and I'm not privy to the communication that led to it. And so the only response I'm going to make to this change is to draw your attention to what it would mean if I were aband to abandon the first topic, faithful disagreement, in favor of this topic, dealing with questions and challenges. Faithful disagreement is based upon acknowledging a history of reasonable theological and philosophical pluralism and prophetic trends within the church that reflect thinking with 
the church, for the church, and through the church. It does not confuse pluralism for relativism, uh, nor does it put its self-interest ahead of its concern for the good of all. It does not set out to embarrass the church for the sake of embarrassing the church, although we all know there are, there are events and structures in our collective past for which we rightfully should be embarrassed. I establish this concept uh, of faithful disagreement as a means of engaging with all in the church who are struggling with the question of whether their disagreement with a few teachings implies that they are imperfectly Catholic. As the title of my book states, it provides a path that transcends the binaries of obedience and abandonment. In contemporary Catholic schools, I claim this is a helpful means of engaging with questions of controversial issues like ordination, contraception, same-sex marriage, and gay-straight alliances. It also ex explores how to admit preconciliar views, uh, views of a church before uh, Vatican Council II, uh, into educational conversation and show those who align with orthodoxy, those who aren't dissenting, the merits of recognizing and including those with divergent views. So to use a title like dealing with questions and challenges puts me into vague territory. It could point to questions I have about my mathematics homework or the challenges I face in recruiting new members for the social justice club. This change takes the object of concern out of view and blends it into the collective soup of day-to-day -day concerns in the school. It's not an innocent move. The combination of these actions has the consequence of subordinate, subordinating the moral importance that faithful dissent brings to an institution. So a concern to avoid any conflict and controversy takes precedence over taking a reasonable risk on promoting justice. So interestingly, I can point out a structural similarity here uh, to the responses which resist the establishment of gay-straight alliances in Catholic schools and call for diversity clubs instead. Uh, likewise, these subordinate the reasons why lesbian, gay, transgender, transsexual, bisexual, queer, and questioning students are bullied uh, to protecting the institutional status quo and uh, what I argue is a narrow conception of denominational rights. And so again, here I point to Richard Shields' interpretation of the Good Samaritan parable. Concern for our neighbor entails risking our illusions of purity and distinct identity that we can sometimes build up around ourselves. So it's important to relate here that I have much to offer on the subject of faithful disagreement, but have never done any research that uses the phrase dealing with questions and challenges. If I were to follow this topic, it would severely limit any scholarly contribution I can offer you. Hence, I did not change the context of, content of this lecture uh, in response to the title change that appears on uh, this poster. So if you arrived here tonight expecting topic two, I hope you are not disappointed and I hope you will remain to hear more. So, for the remainder, here's what I will talk about. Uh, part one, the fact of disagreement and change teaching in the church. Establishing that it has happened, does exist. Um, if we don't do that, then it's really, it, it could be a non-starter. Second, how we think about the Catholic school as a unique space in the church, what I call a public ecclesial space, a place where we can engage with these questions in a different way than we might at the parish church. Third, I will present a theoretical model of faithful disagreement. And then finally, I'll make comments on how a model of faithful disagreement will be helpful. This contribution to scholarship and the church is part of my Catholic experience. And so in the context of my participation in these lectures in, these, in the Catholic experience, I'm honored to share it with you. So here's part one uh, on disagreement and solidarity. So why is internal disagreement a salient topic in Catholic education today? To answer that question, I look to the sociology of religion and specifically to the issues of sex and sexuality as major flashpoints for, of moral disagreement. Not many adolescents, not many students in Catholic uh, high schools find the teaching on the Trinity to be especially troublesome, or if they do, it is in an intellectual sense that doesn't really strike them 
at the heart of how they feel they ought to be living their lives or responding to uh, their friends. So the Canadian sociologist, sociologist of religion, Reginald Bibby, provides data for adolescents in Catholic schools uh, specifically. Uh, and then again for adolescent Catholics generally, uh, recognizing that not all Catholics attend Catholic schools, nor do Catholic schools serve exclusively Catholics. So for students in Catholic schools, he finds that the accept and approve ratings for premarital sex, homosexual relations, and same-sex marriage are 69%. 45% and 45% respectively. This set mirrors nearly perfectly the national data, uh, including students of all or no religion uh, in all schools, which are 72, 44, and 47%. So none of these approvals uh, or none of these rates accord with Catholic teaching uh, and so demonstrates a significant non-reception of it. Then we can move to Andrew Greeley, uh, the American sociologist uh, of, of religion, and look at sexual attitudes uh, of Catholics. Now this data is from, from 1998, and he uh, takes it from um, the uh, International Social, Social Survey Program, uh, and I've reduced it just to four, four countries of the, uh, I think, nearly 10 that he, that he cites. But uh, here we can see uh, significant uh, non-reception of uh, the teaching on premarital sex, on homosexual sex, and on abortion uh, being wrong, even for the poor uh, in Canada, um, with, uh, I mean, premarital sex standing out, uh, especially as, as only 9% would say that it's always wrong. Uh, the data in the United States is uh, slightly differently, uh, slightly different, um, so nearly double on premarital sex. And then you can really see the polarization of American society around homosexuality and, and abortion uh, uh, reflected uh, among the Catholics in the United States as well. And then to give you a sense, uh, another place in the Americas in, in Brazil, uh, significant change on homosexuality and on, uh, on abortion. The premarital sex question uh, is about the same uh, in the Philippines. So what, what we see then in, in uh, excuse me, in, in Brazil, what, what we see then is uh, there would be significant minorities of, of uh, 17 and 12 percent uh, disagreeing on homosexuality uh, and on abortion. And then we can look finally at the Philippines and uh, find this number. So where there are now strong majorities in each category, you are nonetheless left with significant minorities uh, disagreeing. So all these data show that there's far from perfect agreement among all Catholics on these issues. So from here, I can say that disagreement definitely exists in the church. We can find it sociologically. But what are the issues specifically facing Catholic schools? So here I can uh, point to the Gay-Straight Alliance question and policies on uh, LGBTQ uh, students. So the question in Ontario has been uh, settled uh, for now by provincial legislation. There was, um, oh, I'm, I'm one point ahead there. There was, there was one uh, concern um, uh, about a year ago in, in the Yukon Territory on the policy that um, its Vanier uh, Secondary School had put up uh, on its school website uh, on, and it was ba basically repeating uh, the words of, of, of disorder uh, when speaking of homosexual students and uh, was quite controversial, and so that policy was, was taken down. Uh, but that also was settled by territorial executive decision um, and, and not with any sort of Catholic uh, language to, to settle it. Uh, in both cases, there is no publicly expressed rationale for compliance, neither uh, here in Ontario on GSAs or in Yukon on uh, po the policy they developed on LGBTQ students other than simply rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's, to just comply with the, with the secular law, because that's what Catholic schools do. Um, so a second issue then is, uh, is sexism. Um, so there have been several authors uh, write about this. Um, uh, one of the first ones I read was uh, Joanna Manning, uh, documenting her experiences of sexism in the church and in Catholic schools and also her views on John Paul II's uh, papacy and his uh, views on the ordination question. 
Uh, now, there are also uh, views that have complained that the uh, religion and family life curriculum used in Catholic schools presents distortions of dogma, um, or that it's uh, diminishing the emphasis on salvation and putting too much emphasis on social justice. Um, one of the phrases I've read, uh, and this is by uh, an author named Lorene Collins, um, she, she's, uh, her view is uh, particularly critical of uh, presenting Jesus as your friend as opposed to presenting Jesus as your judge. So there's a concern for salvation uh, and that salvation is being underemphasized in the schools. Um, other views are that uh, the schools should be presenting more doctrine and doing less sharing of, of student opinions, and, and that this is also a problem. So what all these perspectives have in common, no, no matter where they are, are originate and what the concern is of the person who's, who's bringing them, whether they want more justice in the school or more doctrine taught, is that they present complaints or resistance to the school, but then what the school will typically do is receive them politely uh, and then leave reception at reception without making any changes uh, and then resuming the established program. So if you present something like this to the school, you'll, you'll get a polite hearing and um, you'll leave the school uh, hopefully uh, feeling happy, but they won't make any changes to the program. So what is the net effect of these events? Well, ways of thinking and mechanisms in the school and church uh, which depend on these ways of thinking. Our, our institutions are structured by how we think about them, in other words. Um, the way in which we receive disagreement ends up exacerbating or making uh, wider and stronger uh, religious and secular binaries. These limitations demonstrate a trend in the church that can reduce Catholicism and Catholic life, again, to rule following, canon law, and catechism, uh, and moreover, very narrow interpretations and applications of them. And so uh, it demonstrates that the theory of Catholic education is unable to respond justly to, to those who have been alienated. However, uh, I think there is hope. Uh, this is also an opportunity for redefining the aims of Catholic schools, and along with that, the public perception of what Catholic schools are all about. So what is this hope? I can describe this hope by describing how my talk sits within this season's theme of a new solidarity. So uh, I'm, in a moment I'll present with, to you a perspective that brings disagreement, the, the concept of disagreement, into alignment with the concept of solidarity. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show how a prominent Catholic thinker has united these. So here's how it reads. The one who voices their opposition to the general or particular rules or regulations of the community does not thereby reject their membership. They do not withdraw readiness to act and work for the common good. Different interpretations of opposition that an individual may adopt with respect to society are of course possible. But here we adopt one that sees it as essentially an attitude of solidarity. Far from rejecting the common good or the need of participation, it consists, on the contrary, in their confirmation. Those who, stand, those who in this way stand up in opposition do not thereby cut themselves off from their community. On the contrary, they seek their own place and a constructive role within it. So it may or may not surprise you that Karl Cardinal Wojtyla authored this passage and that it was published shortly after his ascent to the papacy as John Paul II. So immediately, this might lead you to this question. Does this apply ecclesially? Does it apply in the church? Well, possibly, John Paul II was speaking only of the civil secular world and of the struggle against communism and did not intend this way of thinking to apply within the church's structures. However, insofar as the church is a human organization, I cannot see why it would not. So in my reading, I see here a point of departure between John Paul's theoretical views and the commitments he demonstrated when running the church. So for example, uh, where John Paul 
here speaks of expressing opposition publicly. I can point to the case of Charles Curran uh, in the 1970s and 80s uh, as one example where uh, John Paul and uh, then Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger would have preferred that opposition be contained privately. And of course, Curran, uh, he was a tenured professor at the uh, Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. He came under intense pressure from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith before being removed from his post. He was tenured uh, because of his dissent against uh, Paul VI and encyclical Humanae Vitae. So uh, in order to consider disagreement uh, in the context of Catholic education, I will focus here on Catholic schools as public places within the church where this question of solidarity and dissent is seen in high relief. So what is the public purpose of Catholic schooling? I maintain that one important uh, and essential public purpose is to be an ecclesial space, uh, a public ecclesial space where academic questions about the church and one's participation in the church uh, come together and are examined and, and reconsidered and where people grow uh, in response to their responses to these questions. So I want to look past the formal, in doing this, I want to look past the formal rhetoric that we hear a lot of uh, that holds up terms like formation, evangelization, and catechesis. And actually remember that first and foremost, before we have any of these things, we have a school. And a school provides the social service of education to persons. So if you open up Thomas Groom's uh, book, I think the date is 1998, it's called Educating for Life, and it's a wonderful book, and I, and I hope you read it. And those of you who have will remember that his first example of a Catholic school is in Karachi, Pakistan, and it's not serving any Catholic students at all. It's providing the service of education uh, for people in service of the common good. So likewise, we have Catholic hospitals, Catholic homeless shelters, Catholic soup kitchens. They serve everyone, and not only Catholics. And in doing so, they can show how they are motivated by a concern for a common good, concern for the love of others, and even, if you want to follow St. Augustine here, demonstrating to all students how the love of God is revealed in the generalities of the world and in the particularities of one's person. So I do not say this to diminish the possibility that Catholic schools might form and evangelize and catechize some or all of the students. Of course, depending on the intentions that those students bring to school. But to say that holding these uh, as the essentially singular or central or absolute aims for all schools, even in the context we see of declining parishes and external pressures that would abolish Catholic schools, I think this is unreasonably inflating the expectations of the school. It's asking the school to do the work of the parish or the work of the home. And if you want to read more about this, uh, look up, you can Google uh, Graham Rossiter at Australian Catholic University. Uh, I, I draw lots of these points from his work. Now, the Catholic, oh, there we go. Yeah, the, the Catholic school is academic, social, and ecclesial in a way that the worshiping experience of mass attendance at the parish is not. Uh, one major purpose of meeting at a school is to engage with academic questions, uh, questions of social difference, and then I combine these two uh, academic questions about how we as a society respond to social difference. So in a secular public school, uh, this question would be taken up in terms of the um, multicultural pluralism we see in our society. Uh, it can also be taken up, uh, that same question, in a Catholic school. Um, but in a Catholic school, this all major aim also sits within a Catholic context, and a religious context, uh, where for Catholic students, the question of social difference also includes ecclesial difference, or intra-ecclesial difference, basically difference within the church. Now, these are not topics that we typically take up after Mass in the parish. But they are salient for adolescents in Catholic schools. Um, the, the questions that I raised at the beginning, or the controversial issues, they, they can be deal breakers for some students about whether they want to stay or, or go. Um, these are also salient for adults who are considering their relationship 
with the church when they disagree with some doctrine and are prompted to ask themselves, do I have to agree with everything to remain Catholic? It can also be salient for adults who are parents of students who are coming home and say, I have this experience at, at school and, and can you help me? And, and parents are often a, a point of uh, last recourse for students who feel they are not getting the answers they, they need at school. So I think, however, that the school is set up to respond to these questions in a deep intellectual way that other Catholic institutions are not, uh, because the school can all at once consider the academic, the ecclesial, and the social dimensions of these questions in a focused and sustained fashion with curriculum. Uh, but in order to do this, uh, the school would need something intellectually sturdy upon which to base this commitment. So here is where I go to part three. What makes the theoretical foundation for this proposal? So who dissents, first of all? I'll, I'll describe some secular dissenters first. We celebrate dissenters sometimes. Socrates, the ancient Athenian philosopher, uh, didn't write anything down, but Plato wrote a lot down for him. And uh, Socrates he was very critical of the sophists in ancient Athens who were charging money so that their students could learn the right way to uh, gain enough popularity through their speech to gain power, gain money. But the sophists didn't really care about what, the, what their pupils would do after they got their power and, and money. They were relativists, and Socrates made a habit of pointing this out. Uh, in the more modern context, Rosa Parks, a uh, dissident against uh, racist laws in the United States, and uh, her example of not giving up her seat on the bus was picked up by Martin Luther King Jr. And so here we see um, someone upholding an ethical principle, in this case, uh, the uh, equal rights for, for everybody uh, and anti-racism, basically. And so the principle, the ethical principle, trumps the um, unjust law. Okay, but what are criteria for good dissent? And so th this is what I, what I put up. N not all disagreement uh, can, be, can be called dissent. Uh, so first of all, I would say that um, dissent comes from within the membership uh, and within the knowledge tradition. So uh, the example I always use is uh, if you're Canadian and you disagree with the uh, involvement of the American military in Iraq, you are, you are protesting, you disagree with their involvement, but you are not dissenting uh, properly put because you don't have American citizenship, you're not part of their po political political system. Okay, so it's a, a different way of looking at disagreement then. So it, Dissent comes from within the, within the membership. If you're a, a truly a Catholic dissenter, you would be a Catholic yourself. Um, it comes from within the knowledge tradition as well. So meaning that um, if I were to give you an example of dissent, it would use Catholic language. Uh, it wouldn't use the language of secular liberalism or, or Marxism or anything like that. Okay. Uh, second uh, is that it's contra-hegemonic, or basically it goes against the prevailing trends or, or currents in that tradition. Sometimes we express this in terms of, of minorities. So the, um, here in Ontario, uh, if there, when there's a Catholic minority that wants to establish a separate school, we can call those schools dissenting public schools. Uh, and that's the language that sometimes you, you can see in how these schools get described. And nobody ever uh, poses the, uh, uh, nobody ever asserts that, um, that Catholics are bad citizens or that they're bad citizens because they have separate schools. Uh, if people don't like Catholic schools existing, they tend to come up with other reasons than, than that. Um, but we also have to be careful when we, when we talk about dissent being only for numerical minorities. Uh, we can also use it to describe uh, places where the majority of, po of the population has very little, if any, power and is, and is oppressed. So it can accurately be used to describe the situation of the blacks in South Africa who were by far the majority, but who did not hold any of the political or, or, uh, or, or military power in that country uh, up until 1990. Uh, and then uh, third, needs to be ethical uh, in its form and, and content. So it basically has to, be, um, has to be good information, it has to be properly presented, and um, this, this ties in with, with the idea that it has to be persuasive and not coercive. Uh, there's good reasons, good instrumental reasons to say it shouldn't be coercive. People tend not to believe what they're coerced to believe. Uh, they will tend to show one thing and, and, uh, and do another. But 
um, uh, also here we're looking for authentic uh, authentic buy-in, uh, and and so you know the respect for the person needs to take uh, precedence here. Okay, uh, there's also um, you could say okay that this is what the concept is. Now, um, has teaching in the church changed? Um, in response to in response to the times, and so I'll, I'll offer you three examples here. Uh, the first is the uh, the church's response to Aristotle has changed in the past, uh, and this goes back to uh, the Middle Ages when uh, the University of Paris was teaching Aristotle and received resistance from the Pope that it should not be taught, and there were papal bulls issued to the University of Paris saying stop, and the university resisted, and there were more bulls stop resist. And, and finally, the, the ban proved unenforceable and um, was, uh, it was dropped. And this is of great significance to the church, of course, because uh, who did Aristotle's work influence but Thomas Aquinas? And of course, Thomism was a major, uh, and, and still is a major, um, but it, it, it was the prevailing paradigm up until the, the 20th century in Catholic thought. We've also changed our, our teachings on usury and on, on slavery. Uh, slavery was taught to be natural and normal uh, up until the 19th century, and uh, it took some time up until Vatican Council II, in fact, for that uh, position to be finally uh, very clearly stated uh, that slavery is, is, is not right. So um, Catholic teaching has also changed as a result of dissenters, um, and I'm going to use Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council, as a good contemporary focal point. So we have... Um, Marie-Joseph Lagrange's uh, historical critical method uh, as an example of uh, one, one place in the church that, that did change. And, and the, uh, even though he died before the, before the council started, uh, his work informed the way in which uh, we, um, as, as a church, uh, interpret scripture. Uh, also, uh, Henri de Lubac's uh, work on the relationship between nature and grace. Carl Rahner's work on Mari Mariology and Concelebration, Eve Congar's work on Ecclesiology and Ecumenism, and uh, finally, uh, John Courtney Murray's work on religious freedom. And, and this, uh, it's been documented, was strongly contested at the Council. But uh, all of these um, uh, thinkers, at one point or another, were subjected to, to censorship and uh, to resistance from their religious orders or even from the, from the Holy Office. Uh, and it was only at Vatican II where they were finally uh, either rehabilitated or even uh, brought in as uh, theological advisors uh, to, the, to the council. Okay, so that's, uh, that's Vatican II. But now down to the local level again, how do Catholic schools currently accommodate dissent? Well, the fact of change teaching tends to be de-emphasized in Catholic schools and in uh, school curriculum with the aim of formation, within the aim of formation according to what is taught today. Uh, if dissent is engaged, it is received perhaps only elliptically and without explicit discussion of the question, does disagreement make me an imperfect or even non-Catholic? There are some ways in which uh, dissent does get responded to and, and teachers work really hard. I, I have talked to teachers of how they respond to student dis disagreement and, and they they work very hard to receive it, uh, and, and, and they'll work uh, right up to the limit of, of where they, they feel comfortable in responding to student dissent. So one example uh, of how to, uh, teachers receive dissent is uh, appeal to the concept of conscience and, and how one, uh, in, the, in the place of conscience, uh, considers uh, church teaching and considers one's relationship with God and considers all the ethical uh, considerations that one needs to, to consider um, and this, this is great, and it's, it, it's, it's an awesome concept to use. And the one limitation that it has, though, is that conscience also tends to be conceived of in, in a very private sense, that it's the individual's relationship, and uh, the individual makes a decision. And so we, we don't get the advantage of uh, working on how all of us as a church come together and, and deal with these issues and, and talk about them. So conscience tends to be too private, so we, we fall apart on the uh, publicity criterion. Another way that um, some teachers uh, respond to student dissent is to defer to the home. So um, the example I, I use in my book is of a, a teacher who um, is discussing contraception uh, with, with the class, and she, uh, she expresses all the church teaching and the reasons for this church teaching, 
and says, okay, now that you've heard this, th there is more that you might want to know. You might have more questions on this. So please go home and talk to your parents about this because their contribution uh, to you is important as well. And, and I don't have the last word on this. So this is also an excellent uh, response on the, on the part of the school and on the part of the teacher because, uh, of, of course, if, if you look into the church teaching on, uh, on the dignity of the person and, and the role of the family, the family is the child's primary teacher. And families can organize religion uh, in their home uh, in, in the way that they, that they want to. And so it's respecting the student's freedom to go home and talk to their parents. It's respecting the parent's freedom to, to be the primary teacher of, of their child. And then that leads to the disadvantages of this is, is that, again, it, it privatizes these discussions in, within the scope of the family. And uh, so if there is a student who goes home and finds that their parents are not receptive to talking about this, that student is at a disadvantage. Whereas this, another student might go to their home and find that their parents are more than willing to talk about it and is, a, is at a great advantage. So then what we end up with, uh, in theory, is all students getting the same level of basic information. Um, and I, I would follow uh, Bloom's taxonomy here just for simplicity. Knowledge and comprehension of what you can read and today what you can find readily available on the internet. You can Google these sorts of things. Okay, so the, of course you get the added value of the teacher helping you explain it and, and, or helping explain it to you, help you understand it. But then when you move on to the uh, more advanced levels of analysis and evaluation of, of, these, of these teachings uh, and how do you respond to disagreements with them, uh, here we have a situation uh, where if a teacher does this, you have a trained professional um, stepping back and moving in untrained people to, to do this work. I will acknowledge that there are, of course, teachers who have their own kids. Uh, but if we're speaking in, in generalities here, uh, that this is going to be the situation. So uh, students, again, don't get the advantage of hearing about how other families think, if other families are willing to share on, on this topic. Uh, they don't get the advantage of even uh, a scholarly treatment uh, in, in sort of disinterested terms of, of the varieties of thought within Catholicism. It's contained to the home. So um, those are just two examples. So at worst, in a Catholic school, uh, we respond to the question of disagreement by reinforcing a hard binary between the religious church and the secular world. Now, at best, uh, just following the examples of conscience and deferring to the home, we seem to introduce some soggy middle grounds. Uh, students can persist with their questions, um, although we don't talk about them feeling imperfect or as imposter Catholics. Um, or for those who find that the school is not rigorously Catholic enough, uh, and these students do exist, um, we could just tell you the bishop supports the school, uh, you're free to believe what you believe, and then we'll just move on without making any changes, or even exploring in academic terms where your perspective comes from. So how might we talk about giving students an alternative to this kind of thinking? And so here's part four. And let's not take the teeth out of this theory. It's not questions and challenges, it's dissent. But not for its own sake or for the purpose of undermining the church, but so that it can be done with the church and for the service of the church, or even if you are, uh, for, um, for the person who is orthodox in every way, for that person to be able to receive and appreciate the dissenting view within the church, to give them a framework of understanding that they might not have had uh, previously. So what I'm proposing here is a preferable way, in theory, to think about approaching, receiving, including, and responding to disagreement. So this involves following students' interests. And so here's where I use the construction of imagining students as amateur theologians only for the method of investigating, not, not to formally train students as amateur theologians. And just to situate this within the larger scope of educational thought, um, I can refer you back to the 1960s and 70s when the uh, moral psychologist uh, Lawrence Colbert was uh, imagining this. Uh, he was imagining children as natural philosophers. If you can imagine the, the you know, four-year-old child who's asking why, why, what is right? 
asking all these questions about things that we take for granted. Isn't that what philosophers do? So um, this imagining someone as a natural philosopher for the sake of uh, moral reasoning uh, and enhancing moral reasoning. And then in contemporary social studies uh, pedagogy or the, or the methods that uh, social studies teachers uh, are encouraged to use or, or at least consider in uh, putting their uh, curriculum together, they are uh, offered, um, offered theory that you could imagine your students as junior historians or junior anthropologists who engage with their heritage and their community to discover it for themselves rather to, than having the information handed to you. And this is becoming more and more prevalent anyways in an age where we don't rely on schools to hold and present information to students. Uh, if you have the privilege of internet in your house, again, you have a lot of this stuff readily available. The problem actually is uh, discerning what is uh, good or better information from what is uh, not so good uh, or inaccurate information. So this idea of the amateur theologian for the method of investigating uh, is what I'm proposing here. And this is important for conceptualizing how students imagine themselves interacting with the content of their church's community and its intellectual heritage. Theologians notably work on questions in the church and do not limit their self-image to being mere receptors of church teaching. That's not the role of a theologian is to be a receptor or a sponge. The theologian is, is there to do work uh, on and to respond. And of course, they have to know the teaching in order to respond to it. Don't they? So we're, we're, I'm, I'm not proposing throwing out the, the knowledge and comprehension of church teaching in favor of something else. I'm, I'm reframing it in a, in a new context. So a major dispositional feature of this role is thinking with the church in making a criticism known. So one aspect of dissent is to acknowledge and critique ideology in the church, the, the prevailing hegemony, if you will, or, or, or the prevailing view. Okay, so who does this? Well, since the resignation of Pope Benedict XVI, this attitude has risen straight to the top of the hierarchy. Pope Francis implicitly acknowledges that ideological currents exist within Catholicism when he refers to the church's obsession in recent years with a legalistic mindset on homosexuality and abortion. This is uh, an Associated Press article that the CBC picked up in September. Uh, another way of being Catholic, he says, is to focus first on welcoming people. So this represents a departure from the ideological orientation of Benedict XVI's reported preference for a smaller, more doctrinally pure church. And we can already see uh, news reports of, of bishops and cardinals in the, in the United States who had uh, invested a lot of, of, of energy in, in upholding what, uh, what John, Paul and, uh, John Paul II and Benedict XVI had said were, were major aims of uh, finding themselves um, uh, criticizing the Pope even in, in the media, uh, Pope Francis. So uh, now we can reconsider the role of Catholic education beyond a means of intellectually initiating Catholic students and especially the many unchurched Catholic youth of today into the prevailing view. Students should not leave Catholic school with the impression that their disagreement with one or two teachings implies that they can't be Catholic anymore. Or for another example, that uh, their peers who adhere less stringently to doctrine are somehow deficient in their faith. So for example, uh, I'll present uh, the church teaching on contraception. And so here's uh, so some way of, of putting what I have uh, been describing in, into the actual consideration of, of a question. So um, is this an infallible teaching? Uh, no, it's a non-infallible ordinary teaching. Um, did, what did the Pontifical Birth Control Commission recommend uh, be, be in, the, in the years leading up to uh, Paul VI issuing Humanae Vitae uh, in 1968? They actually recommended changing church teaching uh, to permit artificial contraception. So why did Paul VI write Humanae Vitae the way he did? Um, historians of Catholicism have, uh, have stated that he didn't want to break with teaching of past popes, Pius XI's Casti Canubi uh, encyclical. What have the Canadian bishops written in response to this teaching? Well, in 1968, they issued uh, what's uh, commonly known as the, as the Winnipeg Statement, stating that um, one must uh, know the teaching uh, that, that Paul VI put forth, but if they find 
that they cannot uh, in good conscience uh, abide with that teaching as is written, they may follow their conscience. Their conscience comes first in that sense. And uh, they're very, the bishops are very explicit about this in the 1968 uh, Winnipeg Statement that uh, people who do this should not consider themselves cut off from the faithful. The, the views on the, uh, the Canadian bishops' views on the Winnipeg Statement um, seem to have changed, and I say seem to have because it doesn't seem to be cited anymore. Uh, so there's a 2008 um, communication from the Canadian bishops called Liberating Potential, uh, where they emphasize uh, Paul VI's encyclical, Humanae Vitae, they emphasize um, John Paul II's theology of the body, uh, and they do not mention the, the Winnipeg statement. So the, the views seem to have changed away from emphasizing conscience and more towards emphasizing adherence to, uh, to the teaching as Paul wrote it. So uh, what did Charles Curran write? Um, he basically wrote that one could dissent, and why did he do it? It was because he found epistemological and moral reasons uh, why. Um, now notice how in uh, presenting this example, and you may disagree with it, uh, and that, that's fine, but all I am wanting to do with this encyclical is, is, is not try to con convince you of its, of its correctness or anything. My aim here is only um, to show how I can construct a dissenting view without recourse to secular norms or secular law and use uh, Catholic knowledge uh, and Catholic scholarship to demonstrate uh, that there are other uh, non-secular uh, disagreements that do not have to be put in the camp of being non-Catholic. So in conclusion, um, I mean for uh, this talk tonight and, and the theory in my book to apply across the many contexts that is Catholic education in the broader sense that we are all learners uh, and in the uh, narrower, although still very uh, important context of Catholic schooling, institutionalized education. So for teachers who wish to design learning experiences in anticipation of plurality of Catholic experience in their classroom, I hope that um, this offers some hope that there is a means to teach students how to dissent well if they are going to do it. I would contend there's no point in um, offering them the possibility of dissent if it's not going to be an offer that can be backed up uh, intellectually and pedagogically uh, with, with enough uh, information to sustain it. Now, that's for the student who wants to dissent. Uh, there might be a student who wants to dissent and receive dissent well, or there might be the student who does not dissent, but for, for them, um, the question of how to receive dissent is important. So um, can students who don't have any disagreements at the moment learn to recognize plurality in the church and receive that dissent well too and not push their neighbor aside? I also do not mean for teachers to uh, abuse their classroom or abuse their role in the classroom as a means for promoting any dissent that they might have. This is presented in service of the views that students bring to their uh, school. Uh, next, for administrators and policymakers, uh, I hope that this uh, perspective is helpful in receiving and uh, adjudicating the input, proposals, and complaints that come from the school community. Uh, for example, on the one hand, uh, this school is not Catholic enough, or on the other hand, why can't we have a gay-straight alliance? And for parents, who are often the last recourse students have when things do not go well at school, I hope this provides a way of responding to students' concerns, your child's concerns, without glibly explaining it away. Or for parents, how can I approach the school with a reasonable yet divergent means of supporting my daughter or son? when they need support from me. And then for students, if I disagree, how can I make a religious tradition my own? This is, this is out of Thomas Groom, is, is his, um, his admonition that this is what we should be helping students do. In recovering uh, or learning their intellectual religious heritage, they should also be making it their own uh, in some way. And in fact, I would argue you could trace that view back to Thomas Aquinas uh, as well. I think he anticipates that in, 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 his, uh, in his philosophy. Uh, how can I be true to myself and my friends without abandoning my, my spiritual tradition? And how can I see past the false dichotomy between obedience and abandonment?
So this is the intent of my theory. It's my hope for the church and for our schools that we all may learn to appreciate reasonable dissent for its moral and epistemic contribution to the church's solidarity. And this, in conclusion, is my contribution to the Catholic experience. Dr. McDonough's agreed to, to take some questions. So we have one microphone up here and one right up at the front here. So please feel free to make your way there and I'll let, I'll let Graham manage that conversation. Great, thank you very much for your contribution and uh, a great reflection. I, I really applaud what you said. I, I, I just would like to um, maybe invite you to uh, reflect a little bit on on on, an, on, on a problematic kind of uh, insidious side of dissent and part that we don't see. And and the problematic that's that's really, I think, the the, the major within the church are the dissenters that that leave. And don't stay around to contribute their their dissent to the rest of us. And I see that's the problematic. That's the insidious side. You know, we end up with kind of a little bit of you know Benedict the Sixteenth's hope for the church. You know, that people would would really not see their voice as valuable. I mean, you've kind of framed the question within the Catholic school system. That's extremely valuable. But I think the ecclesial reality within you know the community at large, within the churches, within society is is really, you know, the how do we get those people to say what they're thinking while we still have their attention? Because there's so many people slipping away that my concern is it's hard then to bring them in and, and to really benefit from, from what they have to say in their dissenting voice, which is so important as, as you've clearly uh, underlined for us. Mm -hmm. Is it more helpful if I stand here? Maybe you can, everybody can see me a bit better. Um, so well, wait, what you're describing um, resonates within the literature on dissent in terms of a phenomenon that we call a group polarization. And so that's when people who disagree uh, from any place tend to leave and what you end up uh, as the remnant uh, is, a, is a, a cohort or group that tends all to, to think very much alike. And there can be problems with this uh, in terms of uh, limited possibility for error correction, uh, or if it, it, so, if uh, there's bad information. I'm speaking generally uh, about groups now, not just the church. Um, so, uh, yeah, there there can be um, you know faulty information or or obscured interpretations of, of information that that come forth, or um, faulty and obscured judgments that are made in response to the information you have, it can descend like that. And, and I, share, I share your concern there, and I, I, have, I have framed it in terms of the school because that's the uh, institution that I see as, as having, um, having promise to, to make a response. I would be getting, uh, I think, into the scope of speculating if I were to try to go too far beyond that uh, I sympathize with with the with the concern that you raise. I, I think when you use the insidious or the, or the word insidious, for me, I hear um, you know it's it's um, it's not necessarily in, the, the content of what those uh, dissenters who leave uh, end up leaving. It, it's not necessarily the content that insidious is insidious, but it's the it's the unfortunate effect <laughs> uh, on the rest of the church that is um, is worrisome for the church. So um, at this point. Uh, I'd be left to hypothesize we would um, have to look at whatever institutions we have at our disposal in, in parish or, or youth groups or uh, ways in which uh, adult Catholics come together uh, to, to work for the common good. And, and unfortunately, that's, that's the limit of my answer at the moment. Well, like, like, like maybe let's uh, maybe just take a step back to... Um, to try to imagine ways then uh, to engage these individuals before they 
step out the door. And I think from my perspective, that would be the most, or at least a first hopeful strategy to be sure that all these voices are around the table and that wherever we sit within the ecclesial institutions, whether they be schools or parishes or universities, that we really do open up the door before they close it behind them. So if we can think that way, maybe we're at least heading in the right direction and we can reach out to the others eventually. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a, a very hopeful and, and very insightful comment. So thank you. Is there a risk of attaching too much significance to the existence of dissent? Um, you know, you have a billion human beings that are nominally Catholic. We expect dissent. You can't statistically get people to agree on everything. Do we attach too much importance to it? Sure. Uh, the question is, Are um, please correct me if I've uh, in case I don't represent it the way you asked it, but um, are, are we possibly attaching too much uh, importance to dissent? Uh, would it not be reasonable that since there are uh, a billion or more Catholics in the world that perfect uniformity is uh, just impossible anyways? And, and how would I respond? Is that the... I don't think we can attach too much importance to it so long as um, I think that this is a meaningful uh, way in which people um, and all people uh, who, who dissent, maybe not everybody does, but for all, how all those who do dissent think of themselves uh, in relation with the church. I, I don't think we can go too far in, in saying that, uh, would you consider this as a way of, uh, of enhancing your relationship uh, with the church and, and, and possibly um, reconsidering how you see yourself and the church. For those who don't, uh, don't dissent um, and are possibly uh, not receptive to uh, any possibility that dissent could exist, I would say, um, again, we, I don't think we could put too much emphasis on it as well because uh, I think it's important that they would know how to uh, receive uh, their brothers and sisters who, who do dissent. Uh, but of course, I, I am aware that uh, there, there is, uh, and, and there has to be some some common ground on which uh, Catholics and, and Christians understand themselves. Um, so, what I think um, I am doing here then is uh, trying to um, give more prominence to something that has really been, uh, in my view, overly suppressed uh, in the history of the church. I'd like to focus a bit on the the uh, classroom teacher. And the person that is on the line dealing with, uh, with students who wish to dissent and looking at it from two points of view. Do you believe that the classroom teacher has the permission of, their, of the general feeling within the diocese or within their board to be able to engage in conversations of dissent with their students? And the second part is, do they have the the uh, religious knowledge, background, information that they could follow through the process that you talked about in dissent to help the, the students deal with their dissent. Okay. Uh, just so I keep my mind uh, focused on the question. So the first one is on permission, and then the second is on the knowledge of the teachers. Yes. Um, I could answer the question about permission uh, in this way, is that uh, I could say it all depends on the diocese and, and on the board. Uh, or I could answer it uh, another way and to say that um, the answer is generally no. Uh, I, in, in my encounters with teachers in Catholic schools, there tends to be um, more like uh, an aversion to, to dealing with controversial issues and, and to dissent. So what teachers will do is uh, respond to the concerns that students invariably uh, bring up in class. Um, and they'll be ready to, uh, to receive them and to respond to them. 
uh, but they, they won't make it part of the formal uh, curriculum that the teacher presents uh, to, to the class. So I guess in, in that way, the answer is no, it's, um, I don't think the permission uh, is there or, or the way of thinking is, is there uh, at, at the moment. Uh, and then part two, on the knowledge. Um, I have, in my encounters with some, I, I don't have the kind of statistical knowledge that's, that some may desire on this, but in my encounters uh, anecdotally with, with some teachers, uh, I've heard that uh, there are some schools in which uh, teachers are asked to teach religion because it's known that they attend mass very regularly and, and they're perceived to be good Catholic people and you might have been hired to teach English or social studies as your main subject area, but um, those are three out of your four courses and what are we gonna put in the fourth block? Uh, well, we need someone to pick up uh, the religion course, which that person does uh, in, in all, all earnestness and good faith and, and, and more than likely teaches it uh, very well, but is not necessarily um, um, prepared uh, like their colleagues who specialize uh, in, in religion. To, to engage with some of these um, more advanced kinds of topics. So yeah, that's, the, that's the best answer I can provide to, to that question. If we want, um, if we want teachers to, to engage with this, by the way, it, it would also have to, you know, part one of the question is we'd have to have um, buy-in from, uh, from boards and from uh, local ecclesial authorities and from senior administration and, and so forth. Uh, if we want teachers to take this up, um, my proposal does not call for any watering down of uh, you know, the presentation of, of church teaching. It would actually call for, for a teacher who's able to do uh, what, um, I guess, the best of what everybody hopes for now, plus uh, integrate it with the subject of uh, responsible dissent and disagreement. The church has always taught the uh, idea of census fidelium, what the, the Holy Spirit works through all the members of the church, and uh, therefore water the feelings of the church, the, the experience of the people of, the, uh, of God, and uh, that's always been taught but never been used. So is that coming through? So now we know that the present pope is, is fed into that, and that's why I'm sure all you people were informed through your, through your parishes that uh, you were supposed to send anything that you were dissenting on or what are your opinions about the church, the chancery asked for your opinions and they're all going to Rome and then we sorted out in the Senate of, of bishops in, in October. So I hope you people who have dissents, well, I've sent something in too, and I hope you send it in to have it looked at. The Holy Spirit works through all the um, members of uh, the faithful. Thank you. Graham, if you have reflection on the student reaction. So when, when schools spend a lot of time teaching students to be critical thinkers and teaching them to challenge what they see on the internet in order to filter out what is good and, and take the time to teach them to critically question and then turn around and, and have the tension of not allowing them to critically question their faith, what is the reaction from the students? What, what do they feel? I mean, you've had, you've had a lot of experience on you know, what the boards would do and what the teachers would do, but what are we, what's the message we're giving to the students? I have not done the kind of empirical work with the students that would properly answer your question. Uh, I would have to speak in, in hypothetical terms, uh, and I'll be very cautious here, but um, just looking at the kinds of contradiction that, that you would, uh, th that you have pointed out, uh, or the, the example I use uh, in my book is uh, if we teach um, 
sex equity in the civil secular realm. Um, so, um, you know, emphasizing uh, women to follow careers in science or that, you know, the principal of your school can be a woman, the chair of the school board, at, you know, can be a woman, et cetera. Uh, but we don't apply that same critical lens on the religious side. Uh, I don't have the data. I haven't talked to the students about that question. Uh, but I think it would be fair to say that knowing how uh, adolescents would typically view that, uh, or, or some adolescents, I'll be careful here, some adolescents would, would, would see that as uh, representing some sort of hypocrisy on the school's part, or, or at least an inconsistency. Um, I, I would say that, that that could be a source of frustration for students. Uh, but again, I'm going to be very careful on that one because I haven't actually talked to the students on that one. So thank you for your question. I think that's my next project. And so the closer you think to dissent, I think understands understands that. And, and we shouldn't you know repression is, is disastrous, it seems to me, psychologically. And so when you when you give them the opportunity to dissent in a systematic way, then then they can grow. They can grow morally and they can grow spiritually. You're, you're on something I think is very important, especially for late adolescents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, please. Okay, um, I have a comment and a question. Um, so, I'm, I'm really happy that you explained the difference about the titles in of your lecture because I wrote it down in my calendar, Faithful Disagreement. And then I remember hearing about it like last week in church, and I thought, is that the same lecture? Like, <laughs> but I didn't really. Uh, follow up and kind of compare notes so so that cleared that up and um, Dorothy Day said that uh, the hallmark of discipleship is actually getting in trouble with the authorities do you agree with that <laughs> <laughs> or <comment. laughs> I think that would be consistent with a lot of prophetic voices <laughs> in, in society and the church yes That's a really good question, and uh, I hope I can meet it with the answer it deserves. Uh, I see it in three parts. You might have seen me count on my fingers as, as you were asking it. Um, uh, I, I won't try to cop out on this, but it, it, it'll be an ongoing question, of course, because everything is ongoing. All right, let's clear that away. Um, I think the the best, uh, the be or the ideal way I see this would happen is that um, everyone involved would know more about the church as, as a result. Uh, that this is uh, a, a door that one can open to more knowledge uh, rather than a door that closes and someone walks away. And so the, the second point then would be that um, the, the person would stay in, in community uh, with the church uh, at, at all, you know, at the local level and at the, at the world level um, be, because they have that intellectual engagement, but also because they have an affective uh, engagement, that, that they want to be there to pursue that question, and they see some importance uh, in pursuing that question. And then the third piece, then, is that uh, we can prolong uh, or, or use a gray area in between the black and white of obedience uh, and abandonment, so that if someone is going to leave, 
Um, and if, if, if a person needs to leave the, the church for, for authentic, for, for good reason, um, if that's the best decision for them, I, I think one needs to follow that decision. But that I think this, this gray area would, would, would be a way of uh, uh, enabling the, I, I, I see this as, as an ideal, actually, um, in itself, as opposed to seeing the church in black and white terms. Thank you for the question. Okay, so I don't want to put words in your mouth here. So my impression was that you said something to the effect that, um, well, black and white is not really the way the church operates, that there is the um, gray area, and that the dictionary definition or um, the definition of a Catholic, even if you depart from that to some extent, if you dissent, then you're not necessarily a less perfect Catholic. Is that fair? That the church is not black and white, and that a person may dissent and not be, and not be considered a less than perfect Catholic. Yes. Okay. So my understanding is that the church, because it has an, an authority even as a human institution, that there are, there is a hierarchy, that the church to some extent defines itself, and that, um, in so far as you disagree from that, you're not you're. A less perfect Catholic, not that you shouldn't, not that we still don't embrace you in the church, not that um, dissent cannot still be become something productive, but insofar as you dissent, doesn't that make you less perfect? Well, there's always there's uh, as I established there's there's been there's been histories of, of disagreements uh, within the church, and in fact uh, some of those who have uh, disagreed have in in fact found their their thought to be. Uh, uh, taken up by the church in the uh, in the reformulation and uh, and, and growth of, of church teaching. So I, I would I would really hesitate to to, to um, apply the the term imperfect generally, but you know especially in the sense of uh, sometimes we, we don't know the value of, of what we see uh, right away. When you talk about perfect, my definition of a sin, of a saint is a sinner striving to be a saint. So no matter what kind of Catholic school or Catholic parish or Catholic family you come from, none of them are perfect. The important thing is, are they trying to be perfect? As long as they're trying, they're doing a great job. Thank you. Uh, you talked about in your answer about um, do uh, Catholic teachers have a mechanism to address issues of dissent, and you said mostly it's a version, and we don't have the proper terminology from superintendents or directors of education or school board trustees, and uh, uh, how do we address those issues as Catholic educators? What can we do to um, make sure that those issues are heard by school board trustees, directors of education, and superintendents so that we can have those conversations in our classrooms. Uh, so you're asking me in, in the, not in terms of what we do now, but what might we do? Is that, yeah, how is that, can we, yeah. yeah, how can we bridge those issues so that we can talk about them? I acknowledge that there's, there, there can be some risk involved, uh, first of all, uh, but that there's, uh, that there is not a problem with with uh, with asking questions about these uh, these kinds of issues. There's um, I, this may have to take place in, in conversations in staff rooms uh, first, or it may have to take in, take place in conversations uh, with administrators. Uh, always, I think, um, emphasizing um, the good of the of the school and of the church uh, all put together in in this sense. Um, uh, of course. The, this will vary from from place to place, uh, and I'm sensitive to to context uh, on this. 
but um, if, it, if it is presented in a way that does emphasize the good, uh, and, and, and if we can demonstrate the goods that, that will come, as in uh, you know, more justice, more inclusion, um, more learning, <laughs> uh, broader knowledge of the church and its history uh, and its theology, um, I think these help to present a persuasive case for that. And one more question. I've taught the uh, in Ontario the grade 12 religion program, and it, I taught it uh, bound for uh, workplace students and bound for university and college students. And it's basically the courses of major focuses on ethical issues in our religion. And um, you gave a great example of the encyclical about artificial contraception. And um, But for students, in, even in grade 12, where they're at the end of their journey in a publicly funded Catholic education, um, they most students don't know the ideas of papal bulls and encyclicals and um, even a church councils, Vatican II, all of these things. And even when I was in grade 12, that was not taught to us. So is there... Uh, is that a failure of teaching about the church in Catholic schools from K to 12? Or how do we, you know, to, to introduce those ideas would be difficult just in grade 12. So how would we do that in a, in a better context? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a failure uh, in any sense, because I, I think what the religion curriculum is, is focusing on now is, is good topics, right? And, and that's one of the uh, concerns that you get with any curriculum uh, in any subject area is always this include exclude uh, question. So I acknowledge it would probably take uh, some refocusing on on the kinds of terms uh, that are used and, um, uh, uh, and and an emphasis on the kinds of content. I do know that that some teachers uh, in, in in some schools, uh, Catholic schools in Ontario, will look at at encyclicals, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean all. Uh, so. Um, yeah, it, it, it would just take a, a, a reorientation of the, uh, of the aims and scope of, of the content before you started to talk about dissent uh, is, is the important, uh, important uh, logistical and, uh, and curricular question. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for the conversation and questions. At this time, I'd like to invite forward Mary Lynn Crawford, Religion, Family Life, and Faith Formation Consultant with the Waterloo Catholic District School Board to formally thank our speaker. Good evening. Um, just before we go any further, and I kind of move away so you can see my head over this, uh, it's actually Mary Lynn Dawson, and I am more than honored uh, to be here to represent Waterloo Catholic District School Board. So, uh, so thank you for, uh, for inviting me up. Um, I have had the, uh, the privilege of spending quite a bit of time today with Dr. McDonough because I was involved in a workshop this afternoon. And I just wanted to share with you something else about Dr. McDonough that, that you may not know. Um, is that he really is loving our cold and snowy weather. So I tell you this for more than just, you know, so that we can roll our eyes and rub our snow shovel achy backs. Uh, I tell you this because at first I was like, what? Who is going to like this weather? Who? We are, we've been inundated with snow. It's miserable. I hate shoveling. But then he said he appreciated the cold and snow because of the brightness it provides. Because from, uh, from where he lives uh, in BC, it's cloudy a lot, and there's no snow on the ground, so everything seems gray. But here, even in the cloud, even in the cloud, there is brightness and beauty. So it kind of changed the way I was thinking. And this connects directly with what he was sharing tonight. Because at, at first, at first glance, I was like, what? Dissent? Oh my. Oh my. Why are we going to talk about dissent? That's so shocking and such a controversial word and what's going to happen? But in the same way that he changed my views on the cold and the snow, he changed my views on the word dissent. Because dissent for and with the church is a beautiful thing. 
So for that, um, Dr. McDonough, I really want to thank you for, for changing the way that I see things and for enlightening us with your views. So thank you so much for spending the day and the evening with us today. Truly from the bottom of my heart, it has been a wonderful experience, so thank you. Thank you, Mary Lynn. A couple more things before we finish up the formal part of this evening. First of all, I want to sincerely thank the Waterloo Catholic District School Board for its support of this lecture. We're so grateful for their commitment to helping to provide events such as tonight's lecture every year. I want to remind you that you can sign up in the foyer if you want to receive the latest information about our lecture series and receive regular email updates about upcoming speakers. And you can also let us know on when you sign up if you would like to hear about other lectures and events that take place at St. Jerome's University during the year. Every year we are pleased to be able to present a program of speakers to the community, and we are able to provide these lectures to the community at no charge, thanks to the generosity of so many partners and supporters. If you too would like to support the lectures, there are donation envelopes available on some of the chairs here in Siegfried, as well as in the foyer. And as always, I want to thank so much all those who give so generous, generously to us. There are a number of wonderful, fairly traded products available for sale in the foyer by our social justice committee. So if you're needing some chocolate or coffee or tea, I forget what else she has back there, please enjoy. We also, in the foyer, Wordsworth Books is a present here, um, and they have available a number of books related to our lecture series this year, but, and those include um, signed copies of uh, Dr. McDonough's book that he was referring to tonight. Okay, so that's available for you. Before I tell you about the, the next lecture coming up in our series, I have a public service announcement. So how much I say that, Paul? Um, we, Paul Bedette is looking for a ride to Hamilton if there's anybody heading in that direction. <clears throat> so if you are, you can come up here and meet Paul uh, after I'm finished <laughs> and see what we can work out for him. Okay, He lost his ride in between dinner and coming over here somehow. Finally, I want to let you know that the next lecture is going to be uh, the annual uh, John Sweeney lecture in current issues in healthcare. And as we have been doing the last few years, that means that we will shift from this location and head over to St. Mary's General Hospital for that. So that lecture is taking place not on a Friday, but on a Thursday, Thursday, March the 20th. The event will take place at Heasley Hall in St. Mary's General Hospital. It begins with refreshments at 7 p.m. and the uh, discussion and presentation begins at 7.30. The title of this year's Sweeney Lecture is True Patient-Centered Care, Managing the Transitions Between the Hospital and the Community. So I hope that you will consider joining us at St. Mary's on Thursday, March the 20th. And again, I want to say uh, thank you to all of you very much for coming this evening. I hope you have a safe trip home. And until next time, good night. <laughs>